All right. Welcome everyone to the co-creators Thursday night creator convos. I'm Noelle Marshall and I'm here with my beloved who is muted. Oh no, I didn't. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. For those of you that are watching it in timeless time, so delighted to have Patricia here again this evening. We're going to have a fun time. We're going to learn stuff. We're going to have a conversation. Thank you all for being a part of this live in this time, present moment. Thank you for coming. And, um, you know, we invited Patricia back. She has been with us before. But when you write 11 books, you probably have a little bit more to say and the little bit of time that we have together. So um, that's where we have her back and I'm really looking forward to this. We're gonna have some conversation at the end, but she does have a presentation. And uh, let, me, let me first tell you, if there's some people who are new here, so let me tell you a little bit about the co-creators convergence, then we'll come back and I'll do a more formal introduction of Tricia, and then we will begin. is a little bit about the co-creators convergence and i do want to say welcome to you all it's we're here every thursday night so you can always join in as you can tell we have a lot more uh, guests coming up this month and um, you're all welcome to join us any thursday night eight o'clock eastern time to patricia daily light <laughs> <laughs> our authoress is that a word authoress that's, that's okay. <laughs> okay, we can have a little bit of fun. That's that makes it a little bit more interesting. So, yes. <laughs> so let me tell you a little about about her. She is an award winning author and artist with a PhD in creative art and communication, and she has uh, studied in a lot of places. Now you're going to have to help me again. Universidad Catholique de Louvain. In Belgium. Louvain. Louvain. Université okay. Catholique de Louvain. Oui. Okay. Where she earned a diploma de, in philosophy Thomiste. So you're going to have to say that. Philosophie Thomiste. Okay. Saint Thomas d'Aquin. Saint Thomas Aquinas. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> and she is a world traveler. So uh, <laughs> you can tell that. Uh, <laughs> so her talk tonight is meant to ignite the imagination and provoke questions while examining art, history, philosophy, music, and literature as components of the creative process. Mm -hmm. It is a voyage of discovery. So um, before we begin, Patricia, I just want to take a moment and do a little centering and just ask people to arrive, be present now, and maybe we could just take three deep breaths before we plunge into this wonderful conversation. So I breathe in the world. I breathe out peace. I breathe in the world. I breathe out peace. I breathe in the world. 
I breathe out peace. Mm. So I believe we're now ready to dive into this conversation with Patricia. And um, I'm at your service. I know you have a presentation. So you just tell me when you want me to do what. And as I said, I'll, I'm here to, to listen, to share, and to help you with this presentation. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Patricia. Thank you. And it's an honor to be here. I'm I'm thank you so much. Um I'm talking about memories of the past experiences, how they can shape our participation and we can learn who we are. If we we learn from writing and let the words take over, those are the two concepts to learn from the past. If you can't learn from the past, you're bound to repeat it. And learning from the past, I believe, is from the personal perspective that history is biography. If you can see history, it's not the who, what, when, and where, it's the why. I mean, of course, my degrees are in philosophy, but it's the why, and the why comes from what? It comes from the individual. What was the individual doing at a particular time in a particular place? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? What were they seeing? And so what I'm going to do is take you on a little trip of what I went through and how I got to the point of believing that history is biography. And so I, I started out um, living in La Jolla, California. My mother was a Washingtonian. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was 10 or 11, and we went every other year to Washington, D.C. So I lived in Washington and Georgetown in Washington and in La Jolla, back and forth from school to school but it was okay it was you know my mother's roots were there my grandmother was still alive for a while so I got to know my mother's mother I never met my grandfather he died before I was born um but my grandmother and my mother the reason why I was speaking French is because my mother and my grandmother would speak to each other in French I think because they didn't want the child me to understand what they were talking about <laughs> So, but as a child, you can just absorb a language so much more easily than later on when you question. And, you know, and that's why kids today should be learning languages in kindergarten or preschool, because they can absorb the language. That's what I did. I absorbed the language. And so little did my mother know that I did understand what she and her mother were talking about. So, um, but that was when my grandmother died, we ended up back in La Jolla and I was at the Bishop's School in La Jolla and I wrote something which you can put up if you would like when I was 16. Um, we can learn from, from writing as the words take over and so you consider the thought elements and perception and the perceptual elements and thought and as I said history is biography and we see we feel we respond and this is what this is what it's all about is to so the best response for future generations is to put these thoughts and perceptions in writing which is what we were just talking about if you can't learn from the past you're bound to repeat it and so how do you learn you learn from writing okay can you go to the next one please logic will get you from a to b Okay, imagination will take you everywhere. And that was Albert Einstein. And it was in a dream that he considered he got the the relativity. Uh, his 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 focus was out in another orbit. When you dream, you can let your mind wander and go into different places and you can you you can find something new. And very often in the morning, I I before I even wake up, I have a something comes to my mind about something unusual and and sometimes i write it down and sometimes it's a good idea to just put a notebook next to your bed and maybe write down what came it may not make any sense but later on it might okay let's look at the next one please okay when i was 16 this is what i wrote i was a senior in high school youth needs knowledge to find their truth but there is a gap between reason and faith and this gap cannot be filled Faith can be built out of reason, but it is independent. Knowledge can illuminate some of nature's secrets, but she will always withhold some. 
Still, we must seek wisdom and set our goals in search of truth so that our lives may be enriched and our goals proved worthy. And to bridge the gap between reason and faith is to accept the world as being intellectually and spiritually good and carry within us an inner glow, an illumination of reason and the belief in order and right. To be a shadow is to be ignorant. This was written by me when I was 16. I couldn't believe it. I'm so glad that I had a notebook and I kept these things and I could look back and see what was going on in my mind. Because in the background of this, I had been told the year before when I was 15 that my mother, she had surgery and they told me that she had cancer and they said I could not tell her. I had to keep the secret. And so in the back of my mind, with all of this searching for truth and knowledge, in the back of my mind is trying to comprehend what I had to live with, knowing that my mother was not going to live very much longer. And I couldn't tell her anything. I couldn't share it. So you can go to the next one. So this is what I wrote. I was a freshman. I, I, I was at Vassar College <clears throat> and I was 18. And I said, I feel more and more susceptible to emotions, colors, a stream of consciousness, rationalization type quality. It is not that I'm learning from texts, which is the reason I went to want a college education. It's what I am looking for is insight, pure and complicated. I want to understand beyond outward facts. I want to put my feelings and insight, if achieved, into words, beautiful words and phrases. This is also why I paint, not for the image, but for the expression of an attitude towards something beautiful or something ugly, something I am weighing on my mind at the time. All this probably sounds terribly naive, but it signifies a change in my outlook on what I want to do with myself after college. Not sure I'm wanting to write my painting. Uh, not sure about waiting or wanting to write. My painting is a pure pleasure. And writing is, thank goodness I did this, you know, because it was after that, that after my first year at Vassar, I came home for the summer. You can go turn it off now if you want. And I came home and uh, I went to summer school at uh, the College of Languages and Linguistics, which was across from Georgetown University, right down the street from where we lived. And my mother was getting worse and worse. And finally, it got to the point where I had to take her to the hospital. And they came to get her and they put her in a wheelchair. And I said, I'm going with you to your room. And she said, no, no, don't, don't. And I left her there and I came home. And the next day uh, I went to visit her, very brief visit. She didn't really want me to see her that way. And then I, I went the dog. <laughs> I went to uh, I went to school and I came home. And the phone was ringing and the general and Mrs. Walsh, who became my guardian, said, "You better come." And I went to the hospital and it was too late. She died, and uh, it was very hard. It was very hard. I had to accept the fact that there I was, age eighteen, and I had guardians now. I didn't have my mother. And my life changed. And so what's next? What do we have next? Yes, I ended up acquiring a German Shepherd and that's that's Christian. And that picture was actually taken in Rome. And I ended up going to Paris. Um, I finished my second year. And I, I finished the second year at, at Vassar and then I you know, went to University of Louvain. And I went for a year and have a degree from Louvain and came home. And that's when I acquired this dog in Washington. And I decided to go to Paris to find out more about what my mother's life was like before I was born. She never told me. And I had found letters uh, in a closet that had been locked up because I inherited the house in La Jolla, California. And I was forced to sell it, which was what I did not want to do, but my guardians made me do it. And cleaning the house out, I found these letters that were in a box and they were all in French. They were love letters. 
And I just felt it was too personal. I didn't have the right to read them. And I put them in the fire. I wish I hadn't, but I did. And years before I had gone to Paris and I had met uh, the Comtesse Carl Costa de Borrega, and I found out later that it was her son who had written those letters. My mother and her son were very much in love. But it's a story that you can read in another one of my books. But I wanted to research before I wrote this story. I wanted to research it. So I went with my dog to Paris. Actually, I went to Paris and then I decided to stay. And my dog came to the airport, was flown by himself, got loose in the airport, caused all kind of panic. But he ended up with me. <laughs> and we did, ended up together looking and meeting people and researching what my mother's life was like. She lived on the Ile Saint Louis. I found out things about that. I I I went to visit the Comtesse Caracos de Beauregard um, as she had a beautiful chateau outside of Paris that I had visited with my mother. And then I went and wanted to meet the only living relative of my mother's who was a priest. His name was Monsignor William Hemmick, and he lived in Rome. And so Christian and I took the train and went down to Rome. And I found an apartment not far from where he lived. He did not live in the Vatican with, quote, the old ladies is what he called them. <laughs> he lived in an apartment in the um, Palazzo Doria because the Principessa Doria Panfini liked him and, and gave him an apartment to live in. And that's another story that's in another one of my books. And I got to meet my great uncle. And it wasn't until years later, after he had passed away, that I was asked to write a book about him. And I found out what he never told me. I knew that he had done, he represented the Knights of Malta to the Holy See. I knew that he spoke five languages. I knew that he was one of seven boys. And my grandmother was the only girl. And I know they were raised in Europe. And that's why my grandmother spoke French. She went to Sacre Coeur. And they lived in Geneva because their father was consul general to Geneva. So the children were all raised in Europe. And so great uncle William had grown up uh, with all these different languages, uh, German, um, Latin, of course, French, Italian, Spanish, English. And um, but he had a very interesting life. And later I was asked to write a book about him. And when I did the research, it was after he had passed away. I found his letters that were at the university, um, Georgetown University. And they are in the archives. And they were letters that he wrote to his sister, who was my grandmother. And they were letters written from the front lines of the Battle of Picardy. He was in the Battle of Picardy, World War I. These letters from the front line gives you a personal perspective of what the war was like in World War I. And yes, there's the picture. That's great Uncle William in, in his uniform in World War I. And uh, he never told me. He was a very happy, jovial man who loved everybody, no matter who they were. I mean, from the king and queen of Denmark, we had lunch with them because they were friends of his. Talk about being scared. How, how do you behave with royalty? But <clears throat> I, I, I did it. <laughs> and then the little boy outside who was looking for some food, he took care of him. He, he just was a happy, jovial man who everybody from all walks of life loved. And I never heard a word about what he'd been through in World War I. But when I did the research, and wrote the, read the letters, I had to put the letters in the book. So you get the personal perspective of what it was like in the World War I. So we go from that to what's the next one, please? All alone. So I was, I was all alone and I went from Washington to Rome and I took notes the whole time. And that's what I encourage everyone to do. I took notes about where I was and what I was doing. And this was the sixties. This is a whole different Europe from the Europe of today. And I was talking about what we did and what we saw and what I, what I, you know, my thoughts. And uh, the pictures were all taken, you know, from that era when I was there. Um, there's one picture in the middle looking at Notre Dame. And that was taken from where my mother lived uh, on the Ile Saint-Louis in Paris. 
and uh, then you have, you know, of course, you have Rome, and <clears throat> that that's the memoir. So show me the next one. What is next? <clears throat> All right, this is Tolstoy said, nurture your soul and have assurance that only by doing so you can make a meaningful contribution to the betterment of the larger society to which you belong. And yes, we have it within us to do it. And what is the etymology of courage? Cœur, which is French for heart. And it takes courage to listen to your heart. And that's what I want to encourage everyone who's listening. Listen to your heart and let the words go. Don't even worry about who's going to read it. Just put it down. Write it. Use your computer. We don't do longhand anymore, I guess, you know. <laughs> so put it on your computer and save it so that the words are saved. What, what do we have next, please? Okay, this was a book that I wrote about Helen Holt. When I was president of the National League of American Pen Women, the DC branch, Helen Holt was a member and she and I became very good friends. And she was quite old. And she said, I really would like you to write my memoir for me. And I, I was honored to do so. I really was. She was just an amazing lady. And what I said on the back is whoever said history is biography got it right. Reading about and listening to the stories Helen Holt has shared not only helps clarify some historical issues, but should help the current generation learn from the past to improve the future. Issues like integrating, integrating in politics, the merits of education and for the elderly, and so much more absorbed Helen's time. And it's my hope this book will, about this special lady, will serve to enhance those values from our readers. And she, her life was just amazing. And Joe Biden, when he was vice president, said Helen not only witnessed some of nation's most defining moments, but she has also helped to make them, and her life represents a part of the American story. And she started out as <clears throat> taking her husband, was the youngest senator ever to join the Senate. He had to wait six months because he wasn't old enough. <laughs> and then when he was the proper age, he was allowed to join. Okay, so Helen was very, she was an exceptional lady and <clears throat> I was honored to do it, and she did live long enough to to tell me she liked it. And um, uh, Rush Holt Jr. was her son, is her son, and uh, you know I I was honored that you know his mother let me do it. And Rush Holt Sr. his father was the one who had been a young senator who passed away, and she had to take over. We go back. Oh, this is Helen. She's on the right, and there she is with Hillary, Hillary Clinton. And she was, Helen Holt was just an exceptional lady. But I wanted to go back. I, I forgot to mention something about Christian. Can we go back to him? There. When we were in Rome, Christian got sick. And I took him to the vet. And the vet said that he thought that he had tuberculoso, tuberculosis. And he didn't think he was going to last. So I put Christian in the car and I took him to Assisi. And I had permission to take him in the church of Assisi. And I asked St. Francis to save him. I love that dog. And later, Christian and I got on a ship. He was above first class. So <laughs> he had the best part of the ship. I was down below, but I got to go up there to walk him every day. And um, we went across the ocean, came back to the United States. I went, took him to the vet in Washington, D.C. The vet x-rayed him. And guess what the vet said? It's a miracle that this dog is alive. Thank you, C.C. from St. Francis. St. Francis. There's no other explanation. So that is a true story. And I have those stories in another one of my books, but we can move on now. But I wanted you to know that story. 
because it was just amazing. So we can go on to La Jolla's celebration of its past. Now, back in the old days, not that long ago, we used to write letters, you know, with a pen, you used a pen and you wrote a letter and you used real words <laughs> and sent the letter. Well, in order to research the past of La Jolla, California, where I grew up, I found the old letters from the early, from the late, late 1800s, early 1900s. These letters were written by people who were talking about what they saw in La Jolla. And it gave me an, the view, the personal perspective again of history. And I was able to use those letters to, to write about the early history of La Jolla because I read the letters. And again, it's an, it's learning from the past. So that's how that book came about, reading the letters. What is the next one, please? Okay, this is the book that shows the pictures taken from what I found out was the apartment my mother lived in on the Ile Saint-Louis, looking at Notre Dame. And it was a cruel calm, and that was taken from James Joyce. It's a, a, a poem he wrote. And a cruel calm because it was between World War I and World War II. And James Joyce actually had the apartment above hers for a brief time. And I had to read all of his books in order to have him speak in his own words. Now, this is historical fiction because since my mother wasn't here to tell me if I got it right, I think I did. But I have to fictionalize it to a certain extent because I'm not sure about the day-to-day you know, but I know what actually took place and it tells her story and why one day in La Jolla, California at our house there, I came home from school and found my mother in tears. And you know, those letters that I threw into the fire. Well, they, she was crying because the man who wrote those letters had died. And when we went to visit his mother who is the Contest Carcosa de Beauregard at her home, her Chateau de Chever, de, de, where she lived outside of Paris, she was in tears seeing my mother. They hadn't seen each other in 19 years. And I didn't know when I went to visit, I didn't know what the connection was. And then when I did the research and I went to live in Paris to research and talk to people, I found out the story. And that's what, that's what this book is all about. What was life like in Paris between World War I and World War II? And she was able to leave just before the Germans invaded Paris. So she was flown by her beau, who was Amade Costa de Borrega. She was flown to um, get a plane to take a water. It was a sea flying plane. It took off from the ocean. And she flew to New York just in time because it was right after that that the invasion took place, uh, the invasion of Paris. So that's that book. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is a story that I was asked to write about my grandfather on my father's side and his pictures on the cover there on the left. And I never met him, but he was one of the founders of a place called Miami, <laughs> Miami, Florida. And so I had to do a lot of research because I did not meet him. And uh, I found out the story of Florida, the development of Florida and how it was owned by the Spanish, it was owned by the English, owned by the French, back and forth, back and forth, East Florida, West Florida. And um, I have that in the book. And then how eventually uh, my grandfather went down for uh, a business meeting he had, and he went down to Miami in 1904 and decided it was a place he really needed to go back to. He had some ideas about it, that it could be paradise is what he said. And that's what he wrote. And so he took his family down and my father was six years old when he took him down. And he, if he dredged and created islands and Palm Island, Hibiscus Island and Point View were created by my grandfather. And he would take people out in a boat and he'd point in the water and say, well, this is where you're going to live. And they looked at him like, what? <laughs> you know, and and they they did. I mean, they had Millionaire's Row on one of the islands. And um, 
that's not there anymore. Unfortunately, they've torn those beautiful homes down and put up condominiums. But uh, I have pictures that I inherited of what it used to look like. And um, so that book was, again, research. But again, I want to emphasize it's the personal perspective. In this case, it's my grandfather. And what did he see and what did he do when he saw paradise down in this place called Miami? And how did it get its name? And it's sort of interesting to know that it was actually a woman that was able to get the name Miami for this place. It was, um, well, I, you can read the book. I, I don't want to give it all away. <laughs> so we can go on to the next one. Is there another one or is that? Yeah, I, I also, I mentioned that I love to paint. And this is a painting I did of my son and his pony, Charlie. I did that a while ago. And uh, my kids were raised with the horses. And as I said before, I, my horses wrote a book. Well, this is when I had horses and then I had a pony for my kids. Uh, and they grew up with the horses until we found out what happens to the race horses. And then I stopped doing it. But I raised and, and then raced these horses with my kids' help. And um, those were the days, you know, when I, I never raced a two-year-old. This is the only country we should not race two-year-olds. They're not ready physically. And one of my horses didn't race until he was four. And then he went to his first race and he won. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I had several winners, but uh, when I found out, I told my trainer, no, we're not doing this anymore. And so now, as I told you before, I rescue them. But do we have another painting? Yes, this is a dream I had and I made the dream into the painting and Pegasus in the library. And you can take all the symbols of the fruit and, and the light coming out the window from the left. There's a lot of symbolism in this, in this painting. And it was all from a dream. And this is what I encourage you to do is in your dreams, you might come up with a painting, you might come up with a, with a, a book, you might come up with uh, just your own memoir. But I encourage everyone to just Put it down, be it in writing or in paint, and share it, because that's what we need to do is share with each other, learn from the past. So now it's your turn. Well, the famous book. Okay, Myth, Magic, and Metaphor is based on a class I conducted in Annapolis. Um, I lived in Annapolis on a sailboat for a while, and uh, this is before I married my husband. I was with a boyfriend. <laughs> And um, I went to into Annapolis to paint, and the um, the the gallery, you know, it was the um, it, it was uh, it was called the um, darn. I've just drawn a blank because I just <laughs> lost my sense of. But it was it was a it was a it was a gallery for for painting. Uh, for the arts and they had they had not only painting they had music and the center for the creative arts in Annapolis that's what it is center for creative arts and I said you have you have people doing drama you have people painting you have people doing music but you don't have any writing and they said well you could do it uh, I said okay so I started this course called myth magic and metaphor creativity and writing and they had all the other creativities and I said no writing is also a create a sense of creativity and I gave this course and when I moved back to wash to La Jolla years later um I was asked to make the book make the class into a book and I did and I put my painting on the cover and this is the princess and the unicorn and I had seen the original tapestry in Avignon of the Princess and the Unicorn, and I didn't plan to put them in this painting. It was just a painting I did, a plein air painting when I was in Southern France. I was painting and putting extra paint with a palette knife. I did oils and I put the extra paint on an empty canvas. And when I was finished with my regular plein air painting, I looked at the other canvas with all this paint all over it and turned it upside down 
and sideways, and there she was, the princess and the unicorn. Even his foot, you can see down below, even his foot was in the painting. And I just allowed them to be there. The only place I cheated is I put the, the dragon behind the tree. And so this is good and evil. So the princess is letting the unicorn see its reflection in the mirror, but she doesn't want him to see the evil lurking in the woods. So good and evil is the symbolism of this picture. And it all came because it was something, I guess, left inside my head. And that's, that's how it works. We absorb these things, we keep it inside, and then, like with this painting, I allowed it to escape into the paint. And there it is. Totally unplanned, but it just happened. And you can do the same thing with writing. The words can take over. You can start writing. And all of a sudden, you look at it, you just have the words flowing. And you look at it later and say, I didn't know I knew that. Or I forgot that. Or, oh, wow. you know. And you can surprise yourself if you allow it but you have to give yourself permission to do it. And that's what this book is all about. It's meant to inspire the reader to be a writer or to be a painter or to be a musician, any of the three. It's meant to inspire them because that's what my class was all about. And some of the people in my class were professors from the Naval Academy. And the first thing that I say in that class is there are no rules. The Naval Academy? no rules what <laughs> you know they, they they what but they stuck with me and one professor signed up for three of my classes and they really did a good job because you listen to your heart remember creativity comes from the heart you listen to your heart and let the words take over and give yourself permission no rules now it's your turn <laughs> thank you for bringing that back Yes, I thought that was um, a, a, a very important one. I'm really glad we brought that back. And uh, if anyone would like to uh, interact with uh, Patricia, you can just wave your hand or you can <laughs> do it. Well, Laura, Laura did. Okay, Laura, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There we go. Hi, Patricia. Hi. I'm curious to know about the, um, the, the situation with your mom. Um, and you were told you were not, were not supposed to tell her that she had cancer. Was that the doctors telling you that? Or was yes. that family telling you? No, yes. it was the doctors told me that in those days, keep in mind that's back, she died in 1961. So that was in okay. the late 50s and they, that's how it was. You, uh -huh. you did not tell the patient you, uh, what they had. The doctors okay. told me not to tell her, I had to keep the secret. That, that it brought back a memory of when my mother and father were getting divorced and um and, and they were telling us that, that, that my dad you know said that he was going to divorce my mom and marry his secretary who was only nine years older than me and as i saw them on the bed i thought my mother was dying of cancer and they didn't want to tell us and that he needed to find a mother for us so that's what went through my head because i didn't even know there was a problem with their marriage and uh, then I found out that that wasn't the case. But many years later, my mother did die of cancer and my father had someone to take care of him and he lived to be 90 years old and stayed with my stepmother for 45 years. Oh boy. You know, but it was like that, that, that just brought back that memory of, of, um, yeah. of not, not telling someone that they're gonna die, you know, or, or not telling the children. That, that their mother is going to die. That's that's what that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, and it's because so that sad because she she could we could have had discussions. We could have we could have prepared. She could have shared more with me. But in those days, you didn't. You know, right? There were so and many my mother, secrets. My mother was in New York when she had cancer, with, and we were there, and um, and she was able to you know, talk to us, and and we were able to work out things and what what she should do. She even went with us. To pick out the, the coffin, you know, um, yeah. because it was it was like okay, you know, we knew it was going to happen, we just didn't know when. But um, it, it's something that it's a lot of people was. think yes. that that's a bad thing, mm -hmm. but actually, it helped me that we could yeah. communicate. Right. Does anyone else want to jump in? Um, okay, Elizabeth, you go ahead and uh, unmute. Okay, fine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Patty, as you've done a lot 
you, you have many degrees, you live so many places, you've done a dozen books or so. In three sentences, what has been the most, what have been the most important parts of your life to you personally for your happiness? And then, um, and then to your family and then to the world. The most important, you want to ask, you're asking me the most important part of my life? What to you is mo has been, what has made you the most happy? What do you think is the most significant thing you've given your family? And then oh. what is the most significant thing you have given the world? Oh my. Elizabeth, <laughs> you're, oh. Well, Patty and I share a lot of the same background. We both have a lot of degrees. We both have similar interests, and we have pretty much a Thomistic philosophical background as well. Yes. Uh, we've lived all over the place. So, so I, I, so I guess I have a personal interest in, in this. I, th I think, you know, my children, I love my children, raising my children, even though I raised them by myself. I, I was a single parent when my son was two. My daughters were four and five, uh, or two, yeah, two, four, and five. And uh, I really, really enjoy being a mother, but it was a challenge. And, you know, and having the animals helped, I think, you know, giving a sense of responsibility for the children. <clears throat> growing up and uh I know I put them through a lot because we did move quite a lot but I really am very proud of my children and I have a granddaughter now uh one of my granddaughters well I'm I shouldn't even mention well I have one who's who's in her last year of law school I'm very proud of her um I've got other grandchildren who are in different fields and I even have great grandchildren. I don't feel like I'm old enough for that, but it happened. <laughs> and so um, it's, a, it's become a large family, but I, I'm, I'm also glad that I found out about my, my ancestors and, and shared that, you know, uh, and found out about my great uncle and what he did and and that I had a chance to meet him. That was very important. So when I paint, I'm in another world. When I write, I'm in another world. So the things that are really important to me are both that, both writing and painting. Um, listening to music, yes, I listen, but I don't play. I don't know any instruments. Um, I know Lazinov says if you put you know, Brahms or Mozart in the background, you can get the two hemispheres of your brain together and absorb things more quickly. Um, that's something that's worth working with. Awesome. Okay, my turn. <laughs> you cannot see me because I cannot figure out my video. It oh. died on me. <laughs> this is Stephanie. Yes, it is Stephanie, the talented Stephanie. <laughs> well. I appreciate everything you have said, and I share a very common background with you, obviously married French. I found some letters from my great grandmother, Belgian French, and you've always said, read them and write them. There's so much to do, uh, and your books are so inspiring. Um, the myth, it's amazing, myth and magic, and, Miami's amazing. I learned so much about Miami. I just moved here from California myself. So it's like, oh my God. But um, what is, I have to ask you, what is going to be your next book? Well, my next book is about to come out and I have you on the back of it because it's all about my late mother-in-law who was a living legend of La Jolla. She started out as a medical illustrator. Her name was Georgiana Leip. And she became a watercolorist. So she went from having to put everything in and the day before they had the x-rays, she would lean over the surgeon and draw what was inside the body. Ooh. And then she went from that to being a watercolorist. And so what you put in is important in the one and what you don't put in is just as important as what you put in in the watercolor, what you leave out, right? 
yes. and you wrote a beautiful, you wrote um, the back of the book will have a quote, Stephanie, that you put and you gave to us and it's called How She Did It, The Creativity of Georgiana Life. And I don't even have a cover to show you because we're still waiting. We've been waiting for two years. We're waiting for this book to come. They said it's published. If it's published, where is it? They haven't sent me a copy. And her, I've talked about her life, what she did, uh, traveling all over the world, doing drawings of places that you can't go anymore. She went through the Tiber Pass with two other women, three women going through the Tiber Pass. You can't do that now. She went to China. She did drawings where she was. Everywhere she went, she did drawings and paintings. And I've included many of those in the book. And I have a whole thing of her life and a little bit about her life in the beginning. And I, I'm just in awe of, of my late mother-in-law. She... Well, may I, the, the paintings, the book is amazing. Her paintings are truly, truly amazing. And I cannot wait to see her book or the, your book, but all your books have been phenomenal, Patrice. They are really educational and I see everybody pick them up and I don't mean I'm this is not a commercial but I was in, <laughs> I was impressed very very much we met through pen women my husband is French I became French my French is cousy comme ça we try but um serious one but um there's so much history in all Patrice's books wonderful that are just thank you. truly thank truly you. truly amazing thank you my pleasure well, they're, my pleasure. <laughs> they're all different they're all different categories uh, there's one book that we didn't mention which is called nature's wisdom with another one of my paintings on the cover and again it's a painting that came on its own i didn't plan it the birds were in the painting and i just let them happen but it's a collection, excuse me, a collection of short stories about animals in the high seas based on stories that I wrote for magazines over the years. And um, I put them, somebody said you put them together in a book and I did. So all of all of my books, all 11 books, are they're all different. Very different. And uh, <laughs> Bob, you have uh, your hand up. Would you like to jump in the conversation? Sure, I, I would. Um, and um, I want to focus my question about um, why people write. Patricia, you talked about uh, just write it down. I heard you say, just write it down or just paint it, just do it in other words. Right. Uh, or if you're mm -hmm. keeping notes of your life's journey, your life's adventure, not necessarily knowing why you're keeping those notes right. of, of specifics and details and whatnot, and uh, that that may or may not mature into an actual book that has theme to it and and purpose and conclusion and that sort of thing. And I, uh, Noelle and I have had uh, uh, a number of people say, you should be writing a book. And um, we've also had other folks, both authors and not authors that say, uh, you should write a book for yourself as its purpose should be for yourself, as opposed to, I'm gonna get rich selling a book on Amazon. And I just appreciate <laughs> your reflections, uh, and, and there are others here of your cohorts uh, maybe as well, uh, your reflections on why do people write books? What Maybe what is the range? I'd ask you specifically, per, you specifically, but also in general, why do people write books? Well, it's a journey. It's a journey, it's a journey to take. You don't require an answer. You can ask the questions, but you don't require an answer. You take the journey and in the process of taking the journey, you find a direction that you're going and you may surprise yourself, but you will certainly, it would be a gift for whoever can read it because your life has been, I mean, especially you, Bob, you've had a very interesting life. You need to share it. It's a gift for someone else. It's something that you really should do for others, not for yourself necessarily, even though it makes you feel better if you do it, but it's definitely something there for others. You can learn from somebody else's 
observations. I mean, I learned from what you had, the quote you had from when I was 16 years old. I can't believe I wrote that, but I did. And I put it in a book. I put it in a notebook. I wrote it down and put it in a notebook. And then when I wrote my my all alone walking into Rome and I looked at my past and what I went through, I found it and there it was. And I said, oh, wow. So that's what it was like when I was 16. If I hadn't written it down, I would not, I wouldn't remember. You know, my life has changed so much. Everybody, you know, your life changes continuously. We learn from so many things happening. We're going through, right now we've got a climate crisis. I mean, certainly here in Florida, it's horrible. You know, it's like 99 degrees and, and humid and sticky and and uh, it's going to last for another week or so, you know, and and these are things that are happening in the world. And we I, I've observed it. I've written it down. And and maybe years from now, I'll look back and say, oh, yeah, I remember that because maybe it will be different. Hopefully it'll be better. <laughs> I hope so. Right. But, go ahead. Yeah. We've already got a few more questions in here, so go ahead, but Patricia. Yeah, is, are there more questions? Thank yeah. you, Patricia. No, um, thank you, because I look forward to what you're going to write, Bob. <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> That's your assignment. <laughs> Linda, All go right. ahead. All right, Who, who's somebody else? Yeah, so I'm Linda. Hi, Linda. <laughs> really lovely to hear your adventures while writing the books that you wrote and what it was that motivated you to write each of the books and that they took on a very different personality and a very different experience for you. And I really loved hearing that. So one of the things that is inspiring for me, I actually am in the process of writing a memoir. Um, I have a journal since I was 12 years old. And so I have been using them to help me remember yes, and help me to put together the stories with more detail because there's so much that you miss if you don't write it down. That's right. That's and so right. I just want to um, acknowledge that and to, um, to just say, I think that we all have a story to tell. Yes. We all have something to share that someone else can learn from. And at least, I mean, I'm writing this memoir for me, but I'm also writing it for my nieces and for, because it represents a transition from one era to another era. Yes. And also in terms of what did we learn from our grandparents? What did we learn from our parents? What did we learn? from the generation that we grew up in? Yes. What were the things that were going on? What were the things that helped us to evolve and to move forward? And I think that's such a valuable and important thing to share with other people because who knows what someone will learn from the experience that we had and maybe yes. save them from experiencing something they don't need to experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good point very good point thank you for that thank you mm -hmm. uh, i'll jump in here oh okay <laughs> so first off i will say my mother had a very similar experience to you in that she grew up in south dakota uh her mother was diagnosed with cancer and um one of her cousins on the playground uh, told her that her mother was dying and had the C and used the C word. They, they, they was, didn't even use the word cancer. And so my mother, my grandmother, who I obviously didn't know, passed when my mother was about 15. And mm -hmm. but before she, as she left the planet, she implanted in my mother a very deep Catholic faith, which my mother carried throughout her her. Uh, entire life. She's very, very devout. And right. um, um, and that's that's one little story that I kind of felt like when you're talking about that. I actually, just a couple years ago, uh, she actually lived in a little town, was on Standing Rock Reservation. 
and went and visited and I was able to see my grandmother's grave for the first time. Oh. And, um, but another, another story on the other side of the family is my father. Yes. He was good at fiction, we say. What he did was I come from a very, my mother's a good Catholic, my father's a good agnostic, and I have 14 brothers and sisters. You have how many? 14. Really? And, yeah, biological. Is there a book there, Patricia, or what? So, <laughs> so my, my uh, parents, we lived in the Washington, D.C. area, but yes. my father's uh, family was in Ohio. So he would write to them and tell them, you know, what's going on with this kid and that kid. And, and so at my aunt, what was his sister was in Ohio and she inherited all of these, all these letters. So when she passed, she, it was in her estate. So I took all the letters and they're handwritten by my father. And then I typed them all up. Yes. And then. Um, I think it was one of my parents' wedding anniversaries and all the kids came out and there happened to be 15 letters that I typed up and each kid read a different letter to my parents. Oh, and we got it on videotape. Wow. And why I say my father was good at fiction because some of my brothers would say, well, I, my father would write, well, I took the boys fishing and my brother would say, he never took me fishing. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them were hilarious you know when he would talk about um yeah you know we had a donkey we had donkey carts and oh. we took the one story i'll just tell one little story we took the donkey into town and it was in a parade and my father put a sign on it or someone or someone did it said yes. don't be a jackass vote for so-and-so <laughs> jackass okay <laughs> yeah so that was that was on the on the um uh, on the the donkey oh. um, so anyway it it's a, a real treasure in our family to have what we call pop's letters oh. and um you know it's his recollection of those times and and quite frankly i you know i didn't remember a lot of those things but it also gave us kids you know, the older, there's 23 years between the oldest and the youngest. Wow. So there were a lot of, um, um, you know, they're going like, I don't remember that. No, yeah, that's what happened. And so there was a lot of, we could, yes. kind of the older kids could tell the younger kids some of the stories. Oh yeah, we used to do that. Oh yeah, that happened. <laughs> and, and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, that's a, you know, I really uh, in, in, enjoy this conversation tonight because, you know, while I don't feel like I've had a fascinating life, I haven't lived in Paris and traveled to Rome and other things like that. I'm wondering if some people will think, well, I don't really have anything to, to write about. You know, I just, just what you do. You do. That, that's, that's you do. You don't have to go to Paris and Rome to be a writer. <laughs> no. Or go no. to the Khyber Pass or, you know. No, like my mother-in-law. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh my. Um, yeah, there's a book. Uh, there's this, this book. This is amazing. Time? She's telling this. It's uh, Chasing Dreamtime and Neva Soloway. And it's just an incredible book. And she's being honest about what she went through, which is just, I mean, you have to read it and and this one is serene by tom uh bruce nahan i guess bruce nahan but I this is another one that, that, in the in the in the chat in serene the yeah mm -hmm. oh okay serene okay yeah and <clears throat> these 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 are just two of many examples of books that i've read recently you know i have a whole collection back here as you can see in the library but you know it's just taking you to a time through someone else's eyes if you will you know you just feel like you're there with them i mean as they as they write about what they're experiencing they're honest and sharing their thoughts and their feelings at a time and a place and what they went through and i think it's also considered therapy you know if you have it 
inside of you and it's it's causing some pressure and and you just kind of want to share it well just don't worry about telling anybody just put it in writing and then eventually maybe you will share it with somebody but it gets it from inside out mm -hmm. so it's good for you and it's certainly mm -hmm. a gift for whoever gets to read it like your stories are going to be a gift mm -hmm. yeah. well if anybody wants to know what growing up with 14 brothers and sisters was like but <laughs> yeah. What else? What did, did, did we have another question over here? I think no. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Who are you speaking to? Rena, Randy Rena Shea. Shea. Randy Shea had her thumbs up. Okay. No. What? No. I guess you No. Okay. Yeah, well, I do want to read to you that uh, we did have someone who was watching on Facebook, and uh, Peaceful White Buffalo was her name. She's a beautiful musician. And she said, uh, yay, beautiful. She was talking about some of your books. She says, I dream songs and their teachings. I dream songs and their teachings. Uh -huh. And she also loved the, she said, now that is creative from the heart of love. And I think she was talking about the painting and that she turned upside down and there was the unicorn and the princess. They're in the paint, in the paint on their own. Yeah. And I, I think music, I, from what I understand, it can happen to you also and with music and writing music and and certainly listening to music. And as I said, Lazinov, you know, said, you know, you listen to a certain kind of music and your hemispheres come together and you just absorb so much more. It just opens your mind and it, it's fascinating. And here I have a whole section on on music. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to ask about music because you mentioned that in your overview. And then we also uh, want Coco to join the conversation so she can unmute herself whenever she wants. Yeah, I'll jump in before the music part because okay. I just okay. want to share about um, the fact that you it touches me what you just shared about getting it out, you know, to not hold on to it. Because right. I feel that most of the time, I'll hold on to it. And by the way you shared it today, it sort of makes me see how precious it is. So I, I wanted to thank you for that. Oh, well, really, thank you. Really. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> oh, merci. J'attends avec impatience ce que vous pouvez faire. <laughs> merci, c'est gentil de m'encourager. Um, oh, I love that. <laughs> Thank you, Coco. Thank you for coming tonight. No. Um, let's see. Now, is this out of one of your the creative, the creative act of not hanging on, but yielding to a new creative movement is Joseph Campbell. And he talks about the music also. Uh, I, I love Joseph Campbell. Um, and here's another. Dickinson has a halt meter like a hobbled horse or a Chinese woman who has bound herself with her own feet. And that's a professor saying that, describing Dickinson, you know, the writing. Um, the writing, there's movement in writing too, you know, there is movement and um, the pace. And like, for example, James Joyce, I had to read all of him to write that book about my mother because of the fact that he lived upstairs in the other city. But you have to read him out loud. There are there are words there in his book where you can hear, like he describes a dog's barking. I haven't got it memorized, so I can't give it to you. But if you don't read it out loud, you don't hear the barking. But if you read it out loud, you hear the dog's barking. His words, you know, are sound. It's 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 interesting, and there's a movement and a pace, you know. The, but anyway, I'm sorry. So. Um, you know, you've written mostly about real life. Um, you know, do you do fiction? No. The only the only fiction is the historical fiction about my mother's life because I she's not there, not here to tell me that I got it right. But um, I have not done fiction. That's one thing I have not done. Um, <laughs> I just find so many stories with people and even my animals. You know, I have these three dogs back here. Uh, they're rescues and they've got stories to tell. And 
and in my book about short stories about animals on the high seas, I, I have stories that I got from my, my dogs. Uh, I told the one about Christian, but I also have um, stories about other animals. Um, well, I you have, first wrote a book, didn't it? This is, this is a dog we took on, on the sailboat, Mr. Woodstock. And, and he became Master Woodstock and we made him into a sailor. So I have his story. <laughs> <laughs> but you wrote, you have one book that the horses wrote, correct? Yeah, I have the book that the horses wrote. Yeah. Um, I thought I, sh yeah, it's here. Yeah, the one I showed you. Okay. I, I, you might have shown that one before we, before we started, but yes. Yeah, uh, uh, First Tales and and they talk to each other you know they've got mm -hmm. you know i have pictures in there that my husband took of the horses having conversations you know and all of these pictures were taken here you know he's he's getting mad at him and saying now behave yourself <laughs> so would so, you consider yourself an animal communicator oh absolutely i there's no question i talk to the horses and they talk to me there's no question about it <laughs> and it sounds like the dogs do too. We yeah, have... and then this is my son riding Teddy bareback. I told you about that. Yeah. Jumping can... bareback. He doesn't use a saddle or a bridle. He can just ride him. But <clears throat> no. no, the horses have a story to tell yeah. too. And and, uh, and when I go down to feed them or take care of them, I mean, they have a, they know five o'clock, where is she? Eight <laughs> o'clock, where is she? You know? Yeah, my dog morning. has time too. Seven o'clock, she's not here in the morning. You know, <laughs> I need my breakfast. She's supposed to be here. And then and then I go and they kind of give me that mm, look, you know, and <laughs> come on, where's our food? You know, and where's our treat? And in the middle of the day at noon, they get an apple. And sure enough, as soon as they see me, they come running over. Okay, you came now. Where's the apple? <laughs> Well, yeah. Francis writes, uh, getting back to the other subject you were talking about, Department of Aging now promotes writing as a therapy, giving writing grants to senior centers across America. Did not know that. Yes, several of them are. I'm sorry. Who, who have given grants, um, you know, even, I can't think of any of the names, but I did take a class at my senior center. And it was uh, the lady had uh, was paid by about three different um, in foundations where she had applied and finally received uh, writing grants, just especially to teach senior citizens. Wow, that's great! So they're recognizing that uh, you know we still have something to offer. I guess well, not but but when when I participated actually in a right and teaching some uh, classes at senior centers, senior centers or my senior center, the um, the people really weren't wanting to write a novel or even a short story. They were wanting to write just a little memoir. Uh, that they could give their family. So, you know, you're talking about, uh, as uh, Patricia said, many, many people really realize the value of passing on these little stories to their family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. what would you say is the number one mm, thing if someone says, I'm not creative and you... Yes, you are. I, I, I know I am, but I mean, to feel like, how do you get that spark going in them? Ah, take a walk, listen to the sound of the birds, smell the, the leaves, the air, look up into the sky, look at the clouds, see what you can see up there. Sometimes you might see a dog or a bird or the clouds make these wonderful forms and use your imagination. And then you know you have the creativity in you you know you're part of you're part of nature and you're celebrating it you're enjoying it you're absorbing it and then you can share it and that's creativity right there you don't have to say i have to have a talent and i have to learn this i have to, like i told you with myth magic and metaphor there are no rules 
You don't have to have a rule on how to do this. There's no how to. You just let it happen. Let, we all have it. It's in us. It's part of being human. It's sensitivity. We have sensitivity. We have feeling. We have to acknowledge that feeling. Not give a reason for it. Don't analyze it. Don't go from left to right to left to right. But just let it happen. It can just kind of go like this. And it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to go in a straight line from the beginning to the end. It can go in circles, but it's there. And you just, you just acknowledge that it's in you and give yourself permission. That's part of you. That's part of being a human being. We were the only creature that's allowed to be creative. You know, creativity is a human, it's, it's, it's a gift. I love that. Linda, you want to unmute and jump in? Yeah, I love what you just said about um, how we are all creative. So one of the things that um, I had the privilege to discover um, and to kind of pursue was um, writing with the non-dominant hand. Ah, yes. And I think one of the things so by trade, I'm an art therapist. And so creativity is one of those things that for me, we all have. Yes. And it is one of those inalienable things that, that each of us do. I mean, the way we dress, the way we choose to put things together, the way that we decorate our homes, the way that we do anything mm -hmm. is our own interpretation of the world, right? So there's creativity in that. But yeah. one of the things that I really love that you said before that I was forgetting about was that you can do a drawing with your non-dominant hand and turn it around and to discover what is there, right? So something will suggest itself, an image that if you allow it to emerge from there can also share with you in a dialogue using your non-dominant hand hmm. to discover more about that creativity and not just your creativity, but also that, that other part of your brain that accesses your feelings, your emotions, your, your way, your unique way of looking at the world or of yes. solving your own issues. And I think that's, that's a really beautiful part as well yes. of being human. Yeah. I, I, I love that, that you brought that up, Linda. That is yes. really, yes. Um, it kind of takes you out of your box. And, you know, uh, I also love what you were saying, Patricia, about no rules. No mm -hmm. rules. Yeah, well, I wanted to do a quote here. We, we do not write in order to understand. We write in or, we do not write in order to be understood. We write in order to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's out of what I don't know that I begin to write. And that Toni Morrison said that. It's mm -hmm. out of what I don't know that I begin to write. Mm -hmm. That's what it. That's what happens. It just comes. Inspiration is more important than knowledge. Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. Inspiration, inspire, to breathe, inspire, and take the words. You know, like we talked about, creativity comes from care, heart. Well, we also have, um, uh, what was the word, uh, recollection and recall and getting something that was already there and bringing it back. Yeah. yeah. One thing, may I jump in here for just a second? Sure. Uh, Patricia told me that I should write my memoirs. And Linda, listening to you, I was very inspired. Um, I've had kind of an uh, Fellini life, uh, both in an, uh, art and meditation and that kind of field that my life was living in an abandoned casino, uh, fighting off uh, the Indians living next door, which were wonderful, but getting into art. And Patricia said, write a book. And I realized that I did have memoirs that I started writing back when I was probably in my, well, I found some old poems that I wrote in my teens. And I was like, 
oh my god there's they're they're practically should be written today and plus what i was writing about where i was living <laughs> from my 20s on is kind of like i said it's a fellini film and patricia said you have to write it down and i am so thankful she said that but i am an artist i am not a writer so to get He's this an amazing into, artist well you thank you but i'm a horrible writer i know <laughs> well as far as writing for me, but I have to thank you for pushing me to do something. And I'm very amazed at all these lovely women who've told about their life. It's just, you've got to write. Noel, I mean, you have an amazing life. Uh, Linda, you too. Everybody I've heard from. Everybody, so everybody, this is, this is Con, Cor, 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 Corrine, excuse me, I can't. Corrine, you too. I. <laughs> this is amazing and i'm so happy that patricia invited me to this because you're all amazing women c'est tout <laughs> c'est tout <laughs> that's all c'est jamais tout <laughs> c'est jamais tout, <laughs> jamais tout. Uh, my français is coussi comme ça je suis français and uh, an american aussi but voila <laughs> <laughs> okay I love all the French. Well, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, oh, could I just love... finish with one last poem? Oh, sure, 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 sure. This is a poem my father wrote, and I just thought it would be kind of fun to end with it. He says, I wonder as new faces meet, that smile that passed me by. I wonder at all life around, the stars, the moon, the sky. And yet at times I wonder what, just wonder what is meant by wonders that I have wondered in times long past and spent. Wow, the writing wow. is in your genes. It's For my father. Honor <laughs> the ancestors. Yes. Beautiful, bring them in. But thank, thank you so much, everyone who's, you know, I, I hope that you have been inspired. I hope that if you're not doing it already, go for it. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much. Ahead. And Bob, who do we have next next week? Well, oh. uh, uh, yippee -dippee. <laughs> we have a panel next week of people who have um, had near death experiences. I think there's going to be a panel of four people. Uh, they're part of the international, uh, no, yeah, the International Association of Near Death Studies. And yeah, called uh, Beyond the Veil. Beyond the Veil, Kathy Mason will be luminous lessons from near death experiences and STEs. So uh, that should be rather interesting as well. So you're invited back here next Thursday night at eight o'clock Eastern. Thank you, everyone, for coming, Patricia. Thank you so thank you, much Patricia. for coming together. And uh, I'll edit this, get it out, and uh, may peace prevail on earth. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, everybody. Namaste. 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 Namaste.